Hello, I'm Dr. Lawrence White from the University of Toronto, and I'm going to be presenting a talk on MR imaging of the postoperative knee, um, focusing the um, lecture on the postoperative meniscus and the postoperative anterior cruciate ligament. Meniscal pathology is among the most common of knee pathologies and injuries. Um, meniscal surgical treatment options in the setting of an unstable meniscal tear include partial meniscectomy or meniscal repair. And this is to reestablish stability of the residual meniscus and attempts to preserve as much meniscal tissue as possible in the postoperative setting. Now, MR imaging has been well documented as an accurate test in the evaluation of um, virgin meniscal pathology, and difficulties with MR imaging have been uh, clearly recognized in evaluation of the postoperative meniscus dating back to early studies with MR uh, back in the late um, 1980s and early 1990s. Now, these early studies showed that the standard or classic um, MR diagnostic criteria of a meniscal tear, namely abnormal morphology of the meniscus or the presence of surfacing intrameniscal short TE, so T1 or proton density signal intensity um, within the meniscus, may be normal findings postoperatively, and thus limited the accuracy of MR imaging assessment of the postoperative meniscus using these diagnostic criteria. Now, some examples illustrating this. This is a young patient who had a traumatic injury of the knee, an ACL tear, and a vertical peripheral tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus here, illustrated on the proton density sagittal and fat-suppressed T2-weighted um, sagittal images of the knee. And you can see clearly that vertical uh, tear. The MR imaging appearance um, 12 months following meniscal repair in this instance shows um, healing at the site of the prior meniscal tear, but residual elevated short TE um, signal intensity. So you can see it on the proton density image but no fluid signal on the T2-weighted um, image at the site of the meniscal repair, uh, likely reflective of scar tissue granulation and healing at the site of the prior meniscal tear following um, meniscal repair itself, um, a potential cause for persistent elevated short TE signal extending to the neoarticular surface of the meniscus after uh, meniscal repair that could be a diagnostic um, challenge um, when using standard MR imaging diagnostic criteria. Another patient with a prior meniscectomy of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, you can see the um, mild truncation and the normal size, so it's a mildly diminutive posterior horn of the medial meniscus. It should be larger than the anterior horn in all instances. And we see this elevated short TE signal. So on the proton density um, uh, image, you can see signal extending to the inferior neoarticular uh, surface of the meniscus following men partial meniscectomy. Now, this is thought to be related to uh, prior um, healed margin of a tear or previous intrameniscal um, signal which now extends to the neo-inferior articular surface, in this case, of the meniscus following meniscectomy and resection of an unstable component of the meniscus, um, and thus a, once again, cause of elevated short TE signal extending to the surface of a meniscus in the setting of an intact uh, meniscus after uh, meniscectomy. Now, because of these problems, subsequent investigations into diagnostic criteria of a recurrent or residual meniscal tear with conventional MR imaging have um, helped to refine the diagnostic criteria utilized, um, looking specifically for surfacing um, intrameniscal elevated T2-weighted signal or fluid signal intensity on high contrast um, 
high signal to noise uh, modern MR imaging uh, platforms such as we nowadays have with fast spin echo um, imaging with multi-channel um, coils. Now this has provided markedly improved accuracy of conventional MR imaging, particularly increased specificity of conventional MR imaging in the diagnosis of recurrent and residual meniscal tears that's approaching, but not quite equivalent to the diagnostic accuracy in evaluation of the preoperative meniscus itself. Uh, an example here, proton density in a fast spin echo T2 weighted um, image with fat suppression showing um, signal extending to the inferior articular surface of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus um, in this patient who had prior partial meniscectomy. Importantly, T2 weighted signal in that exact corresponding area corresponding to fluid extending into a recurrent or residual meniscal tear cleft in this patient with an arthroscopically proven recurrent tear following prior meniscectomy. Another patient here, posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, once again, very similar changes, elevated short TE signal extending um, into the substance of the po residual posterior horn of the lateral meniscus following um, prior partial lateral meniscectomy and corresponding elevated T2 weighted signal intensity or fluid signal intensity extending into that corresponding area um, in this patient with an arthroscopically proven uh, recurrent tear um, following partial meniscectomy. Now, in addition to signal changes of the meniscus, um, we also need to be cognizant of other um, specific changes that we can see in the postoperative setting that may be uh, indicative of recurrence or residual meniscal tear following surgery. Now, this is a young patient who had a um, injury um, following a skiing accident, and they had a, an acute anterior cruciate ligament. You can see with an empty notch sign on this coronal intermediate weighted acquisition, and this peripheral undersurface tear of the body and posterior horn of the um, medial meniscus as a result of their acute injury. Now, this patient went on to ACL reconstruction. You can see the graft here on the coronal image and also had a repair of that peripheral undersurface tear with suturing of the meniscus at the time of surgery. You can see some artifact within the uh, meniscus on this corresponding gradient echo coronal image. And these images were obtained one year following um, the ACL reconstruction and meniscal repair. Now, this patient returned um, two years after the initial surgery with um, mechanical symptoms and pain within their joint. And importantly, now uh, we see a diminutive body and posterior horn of the medial meniscus and a centrally displaced meniscal fragments on the coronal images and another unstable flap tear component of a recurrent tear of the medial meniscus extending into the superior um, uh, parameniscal gutter um, deep to the MCL in this patient with a recurrent tear of the medial meniscus after prior meniscal repair. Now, because of the problems that um, initial MR uh, imaging and investigators had with conventional uh, MRI in the assessment of the postoperative meniscus, some investigators in, um, advocated the use of MR arthrography as a more accurate means of assessment of the postoperative meniscus. Um, with MR arthrography, obviously, there is um, introduction of contrast material into the articulation. And at MR imaging, we're looking for contrast imbibition or extension into the substance of the meniscus as an indication of a recurrent or residual meniscal tear. Now, the benefits of MR arthrography over conventional MR imaging include a distension of the joint space that's afforded by um, introduction of fluid into the joint, um, increased intra-articular pressure once again as a result of that uh, introduced fluid and contrast material, and increased uh, image contrast afforded by the T1 shortening um, uh, associated with uh, intra-articular gadolinium. Here on this coronal T2, sorry, T1 weighted image with fat suppression, you can see a recurrent radial tear of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus following prior lateral partial meniscectomy. Such radial tears uh, 
um, have a higher incidence in the post-operative meniscus, particularly after partial meniscectomy as a result of loss of the native hoop stress of the meniscus and an important pattern to recognize and look for on post-operative MR um, images for assessment of recurrent or residual tears here in an MR arthrographic examination. Another patient clearly showing uh, nicely, I think, a recurrent complex tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus in a patient who had um, prior partial meniscectomy, and you can see contrast extending from the joint into the substance of the meniscus on this T1-weighted fat-suppressed image, um, clearly definitive of a, a recurrent tear of the um, meniscus, and that was proven at subsequent um, surgical arthroscopy. Two other patients just, again, showing um, morphologic changes and imaging changes of a residual horizontal cleft here um, within the body of the medial meniscus after partial meniscectomy, and another patient who had a partial meniscectomy here showing contrast extension into a recurrent tear of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus following partial meniscectomy. Now, uh, investigations looking at the utility of MR arthrography have shown that MR arthrography um, provides some increased accuracy over conventional MR imaging and assessment of the postoperative meniscus, particularly when there's been prior resection of greater than 25% of um, the native meniscal tissue. It's also been shown that MR arthrography may afford increased um, advantage and assessment of um, the meniscus after meniscal repair, although that hasn't been my personal anecdotal experience in a clinical practice, and that uh, meniscal repairs that do re-tear, um, they re-tear with breakdown and um, uh, at the meniscal repair site and um, true um, fragmentation of the associated uh, meniscus, so a catastrophic sort of uh, um, breakdown of the repair site. Now, importantly, though, um, investigations looking into MR arthrography as compared to um, conventional MR imaging and assessment of the postoperative meniscus have shown an increased accuracy of MR arthrography over conventional MR imaging. That's particularly true in the setting of prior resection of greater than 25% of the native meniscal tissue. And it's also been um, highlighted that MR arthrography may provide increased diagnostic um, accuracy in the setting of prior meniscal repair. I must say that hasn't been my personal experience in the setting of prior meniscal repairs, and that when I've seen um, cases of recurrent tearing um, post-meniscal uh, repair, those are pretty clear to me as a breakdown of the meniscus at the site of the prior repair. Now, importantly, though, um, studies have, have shown that uh, conventional MR imaging is just as accurate as MR arthrography in assessment of the postoperative meniscus in the setting of prior resection of less than 25% of the meniscus, which is um, a common postoperative um, scenario, uh, remembering that uh, surgeons try to resect as little meniscal uh, tissue as possible at the time of um, meniscectomy and surgery. Now, overall, there may be a, a mild incremental increase in accuracy of direct MR arthrography over conventional MR imaging, but studies to date have still not shown a statistically significant difference and um, statistically significant benefit of MR arthrography um, as compared to conventional MR imaging in all um, patients after prior uh, meniscal surgery. Now, yet another technique that has been advocated um, in the literature and in clinical practice um, in assessment of the postoperative meniscus is CT arthrography. Now, CT arthrography has um, superior spatial resolution as compared to um, MR imaging, and importantly, is unhindered um, by signal characteristics of the postoperative meniscus, such as granulation tissue, scar tissue, or intrasubstance degenerative signal changes within the meniscus, which may be, once again, a cause of persistent elevated short TE um, signal extending to the um, meniscal articular surface after prior surgery. Now, um, one of the potential 
Limitations of CT arthrography, though, is that it may be very oversensitive to small partial um, irregularities or um, surface um, incongruities of the residual um, uh, meniscus after meniscectomy or meniscal repair that are still stable biomechanically. And this is a practical limitation of many studies comparing MR arthrography and CT. Um, and it's important to recognize that CT arthrography, because of its increased spatial resolution, may be very, very sensitive to such um, uh, post-operative changes that may be in the spectrum of normal. So some examples here, a horizontal cleft within a um, media body of the medial meniscus fo following partial meniscectomy, a recurrent um, meniscal um, tear in this patient. Another patient at CT arthrography showing a recurrent or residual tear of the undersurface of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus with contrast extending into the substance of the meniscus on the sagittal reconstruction of the axial uh, CT imaging data set. And yet another patient here with a large flap displaced tear of meniscal tissue here seen on the sagittal um, reconstructed images in the region of the intercondylar um, notch, showing this displaced meniscal tissue arising from the posterior horn of the um, medial meniscus, a recurrent, unstable um, tear of the medial meniscus. Now, also important in consideration of how we um, evaluate patients um, following prior meniscal surgery um, is which imaging technique really provides us with the greatest utility and assessment of other potential causes of symptoms postoperatively in patients with prior meniscal surgery? Um, such potential changes that may uh, be seen in the postoperative knee that could lead to um, patient symptoms include local osteoarthritis um, within the knee after uh, meniscal surgery, acute um, traumatic uh, cartilage lesions, which can be very difficult um, in either the preoperative or postoperative setting to distinguish from meniscal pathology, or um, changes in the underlying um, subchondral um, marrow of the femur or tibia, um, such as insufficiency fractures, which may be seen um, in increased incidence uh, following uh, prior um, partial meniscectomy in particular, and loss of the normal biomechanical advantages of the native uh, meniscus in weight bearing within the joint. And once again, we also have to consider any other potential derangement of the joint as a cause for symptoms in patients with prior um, history of meniscal surgery. And here's a patient who had symptoms um, five years after prior meniscal repair. And um, you can see the site of uh, prior meniscal tearing and um, as a vertical elevated signal intensity within the periphery of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Um, this uh, elevated short TE signal, once again, is not associated with fluid signal intensity extending through that corresponding area on the T2-weighted acquisition. But what we do see that could be um, reflective of the um, patient's symptoms or severe cartilage loss over the weight-bearing aspect of the medial femoral condyle and, medi and medial tibial plateau, and subchondral changes reflective of subchondral cysts and possibly subchondral insufficiency um, or microtrabecular fracturing um, in the medial tibial plateau with surrounding um, marrow edema. So good um, assessment of the knee for other causes of pathology with conventional MR imaging acquisitions. Now let's turn our attention to the anterior cruciate ligament. Now the anterior cruciate is a critical structure in affording stability to the knee joint. And in the setting of an anterior cruciate tear and, and ACL instability, the mainstay of modern treatment is surgical reconstruction of the ACL itself. And this is to recapitulate the biomechanical function of the native anterior cruciate ligament. Now, there's still controversy as to truly the benefits of anterior cruciate uh, reconstructive surgeries. We, we do know the implications of a um, ACL deficient uh, knee and the natural history that such patients progress to advanced early osteoarthritic changes within their joint as a result of instability of the articulation. However, to date, 
there's really been no good um, prospective study showing the outcome benefits of a acute um, ACL reconstruction um, compared to conservative management with physiotherapy um, and uh, potential bracing of the knee joint over ACL reconstruction um, as far as prevention of um, early onset osteoarthritis. Now, despite that controversy, um, over 100,000 anterior cruciate uh, ligament reconstructions um, are performed surgically in the U.S. per year. And these reconstructions are typically performed with autograft or allograft biologic reconstructs. Um, the two most common ones utilized are bone patellar tendon bone reconstruction constructs. Um, they are harvested from the middle third of the patellar tendon with bone plugs um, harvested proximally from the inferior pole of the patella and distally from the region of the tibial tubercle. The other common type of biologic um, allograft or sorry, autograft construct is a hamstring graft. And this is uh, obtained from harvesting the distal uh, portions of the tendons of the semitendinosus and gracilis. Um, and this, these uh, bundles are um, folded upon one another, sutured together to form a four bundle type um, construct for reconstruction of the anterior cruciate ligament. Now, single bundle ACL reconstructions, uh, surgeons are generally attempting to reproduce the anatomy of the anterior medial bundle of the anterior, of the native anterior cruciate ligament. To do so, surgeons try to position the femoral tunnel at the center of the native femoral origin of the anterior medial and posterior lateral bands of the anterior cruciate ligament. And on sagittal imaging, this is generally or approximates to sort of the interface and intersection point of the physeal scar and posterior cortex of the distal um, femoral metadiaphysis. The tibial tunnel is positioned such that the graft is um, aligned just posterior to the intercondylar shelf um, here in the sagittal image with the knee in a fully extended position. And this is to avoid impingement, uh, mechanical impingement upon the graft with extension of the knee. We're going to come to uh, rediscuss that in a couple moments. Now, malpositioning of tunnels, whether femoral or tibial, um, can lead to operative complications at the time of surgery or graft instability or impingement um, in the post-operative uh, setting. Now, it's also important to uh, recognize and evaluate the orientation of the ACL graft in the coronal plane. And it's been shown that uh, optimal surgical graft orientation in the coronal plane is such that the graft is oriented less than 75 degrees relative to the tibial articular um, surface or tibial plateau. And this is an important um, uh, feature of modern uh, ACL reconstruction techniques and is um, important to avoid graft laxity postoperatively, to avoid um, features that may lead to limited um, extension of the knee joint. And if a graft is positioned too uh, vertically within the joint, it's also recognized that ACL grafts can um, mechanically impinge upon the uh, PCL, as in this case, you could see if that graft was oriented quite vertically, it would be um, mechanically abutting the proximal limb of the PCL in this coronal um, image, image. So important to assess the orientation of the ACL graft on the coronal plane as well. Now, the clinical indications for imaging of the knee after ACL reconstruction include recurrent ACL instability, which may be seen in the setting of graft disruption or dislodgement, may be also seen in the setting of graft stretching, where we'll see a, an imaging, an intact graft, so we'll see intact graft fibers, but clinically those patients may have instability at physical examination. And the other big group of uh, patient symptoms that we want to assess at uh, um, post-operative imaging include uh, uh, patients who have limited extension and limited terminal extension of the um, knee. So they lose that last 5 to 10 degrees of um, terminal extension of the uh, leg at the knee. And this may be related to graft impingement with an anteriorly positioned tibial tunnel 
or related to arthrofibrosis or a cyclops lesion that we'll talk about in just a moment. And then, um, as always, uh, new or recurrent symptoms of joint derangement can also be importantly assessed um, in the postoperative setting. Now, this is a sagittal proton density image illustrating a complete tear of a prior ACL reconstruction, and you can see discontinuity of the graft fibers um, and distally fibers that are flipped anteriorly into the um, intercondylar notch in this patient with complete disruption of the ACL graft. Now, um, graft fiber discontinuity um, can be assessed at MR imaging, and it's a direct sign of failure of an ACL graft. We look for an MR Im imaging complete or partial disruption of graft fibers. Here, a coronal image, and I think we can all nicely see complete disruption of the ACL graft fibers in the coronal plane in this patient with recurrent instability and tearing of their ACL graft. Two other patients with evidence of uh, complete tears of uh, prior ACL reconstructions, and again, um, non-visualization of the normal ACL graft where we should expect it in the intercondylar um, region, um, and focal discontinuity and disruption of graft fibers here, which are redundant and once again flipped um, anteriorly on this patient with on the T2-weighted sagittal acquisition. Partial tears, um, very similar. You may see some intact fibers, but other fibers that are completely disrupted. Um, and these are high-grade, um, near-complete tears when we see still some residual um, wisps of ACL graft that's still um, in continuity, but the majority of fibers torn in both of these um, cases. Now, another cause of clinical graft instability is the failure of graft fixation. So on MR imaging, we may see loosening dislodgement or failure of graft um, fixation hardware, as in this patient who had dislodgement and distal migration of an interference uh, screw related to um, ACL reconstruction. We may also see failure of graft incorporation, so failure of incorporation of bone plugs in the setting of a prior bone patellar tendon bone ACL reconstruction. And um, Here's such a case where we see a bone plug which has been um, dislodged and has migrated proximally and is situated up in the uh, joint at the joint line where that bone plug should be situated within the tibial tunnel and fixed in this location. And this patient presented with graft instability and symptoms of a failure of the graft related to the uh, failure of incorporation of the distal uh, margin of the ACL graft itself. Now, I mentioned previously another clinical indication for MR imaging evaluation of the knee after ACL reconstruction is that of limited um, terminal extension of the joint. And this may be related to uh, one of the big causes, graft impingement. And this is classically seen where the tibial tunnel is positioned anteriorly, too far anteriorly, such that the intercondylar notch or osteophytes at the intercondylar notch mechanically impinge upon the graft with the knee in extension. And this leads to focal mechanical deviation of the graft with uh, the knee in an extended position and progressive changes of fibrosis, partial tearing, and potentially um, progressive complete tearing of graft fibers over time as a result of that anteriorly positioned tibial tunnel. Now here, another patient um, with graft impingement, and you can see the focal posterior deviation of the graft by the intercondylar aspect of the distal femur with the knee in full extension. In this patient, we can also see some elevated signal on the short TE and T2-weighted images, illustrative of um, the fibrotic changes and partial tearing that's probably happening on a microscopic level within the graft um, construct. Um, and which predisposes this graft to um, instability and progressive tearing potentially over time. Another group of patients who can present with terminal limited um, extension of the articulation or limited terminal extension of the articulation are patients who present with arthrofibrosis or a cyclops lesion of the articulation. Now, arthrofibrosis um, is a non-specific term, and it just truthfully refers to fibrosis or scarring within the uh, joint itself. This scarring can, in some cases, um, present in a diffuse 
uh, form where you can see sheets of fibrosis within the articulation, or more classically and clinically more frequent is a focal nodular form of arthrofibrosis, which has also been um, called a cyclops lesion. Now, cyclops lesions can be seen in up to 10% of patients following prior ACL reconstruction and uh, presents with a nodular fibrotic mass in a very typical location within the anterior aspect of the uh, joint. These are thought to be nodular inflammatory responses to potentially little bone fragments, cartilage fragments, or residual fibers of native ligamentous tissue um, as a result or um, secondary to the um, ACL reconstruction surgery. And patients will present with a limited terminal extension of the articulation as a result of mechanical impingement of the uh, cyclops lesion between femur and tibia and potentially um, symptoms, symptomatic pain in the postoperative setting. Now, on MR imaging, um, cyclops lesions uh, can present as variable-sized nodular um, masses of intermediate to low signal intensity that are situated in a very typical location immediately anterior to the distal ACL graft, just proximal to its insertion or um, into the tibial tunnel. The treatment of uh, symptomatic cyclops lesions is that of arthroscopic debridement or resection of these uh, nodular masses of fibrosis and um, potentially performing a concomitant uh, notchplasty or enlargement mechanically of the intercondylar notch at the time of surgery. Here's a patient. You can see very nicely this uh, nodular fibrotic mass on the coronal images impinged between the femur and the tibia with the knee in extension. And on the axial images, this is the ACL graft. And this intermediate heterogeneous T2-weighted, uh, sort of low T2-weighted signal intensity mass is the cyclops or focal fibrotic, arthrofibrotic uh, lesion postoperatively, a cyclops lesion in the setting of prior ACL reconstruction. Now, other miscellaneous findings can also be seen in the postoperative setting following ACL reconstruction. Um, this includes a fracture of bone or um, fixation hardware. Uh, fract classic fractures that can be seen in the postoperative setting include fractures of the inferior pole of the patella um, in patients with prior bone patellar tendon um, graft reconstructions, um, where the inferior pole of the patella is weakened and predisposed to fracture, or fracture of the posterior cortex of the distal femur that can occur intraoperatively, a so-called blowout fracture at the time of um, insertion of an interference screw or other fixation hardware um, where a, um, the femoral tunnel related to an ACL graft is placed very close to the posterior cortex of the um, distal femoral metaphysis. Other changes that can be seen in the postoperative setting include um, graft ganglion cysts, which um, are most commonly seen within the tibial tunnel, but uh, can extend and migrate from the tibial tunnel up into the articulation and can even extend uh, beyond the confines of the ACL graft itself into the adjacent um, articulation of the joint. These typically um, appear as fusiform uh, fluid signal intensity um, enlargements within the tibial tunnel. And as I mentioned, they can also migrate distally and present as a fluctuant mass at the um, distal um, exit point of the tibial tunnel from the proximal uh, tibial um, diaphysis. Another change that can be seen in the postoperative setting that uh, we are sometimes asked to assess is um, tunnel widening or widening of the tibial ephemeral tunnels around the graft construct. This can be the result of mechanical motion of the graft within the tunnel and over time mechanical um, widening of the um, tunnels themselves or can be the result of inflammatory change around the graft um, within the femoral or tibial tunnels and associated enlargement of the femoral or tibial ACL reconstruction tunnels. Here, a patient, um, the T2-weighted fat-suppressed um, image, a sagittal uh, plane, and a corresponding um, sagittal reconstruction of an axial uh, CT data set in the same patient, showing an atypical um, ACL graph with increased attenuation on the CT um, imaging study. In this patient, we see lobulated enlargement of the tibial tunnel 
here on the MR image and on the corresponding CT study, as well as these nodular um, masses within the articulation, as well as extending into the um, para-articular uh, soft tissues from the joint capsule. And this is a patient who had an inflammatory reaction to a um, artificial or synthetic ACL reconstruction, uh, which this ACL graft made out of Gore-Tex material, um, which incited a, a tremendous inflammatory response within the knee, causing synovitis and inflammatory enlargement of the um, ACL fixation tunnels as a result of the inflammatory and granulomatous reaction to the um, synthetic material itself. So I want to thank you for your attention, and hopefully the lecture has been of benefit in reviewing um, critical MR imaging uh, principles and features of the postoperative meniscus and the postoperative uh, patient following ACL uh, reconstruction. Thank you very much.